But let's say a very good morning to Theo Rusherwood, political commentator, of course, of this parish. Theo, very good morning to you. Very good morning to you, Mike. Great so, I mean, shall we start with um, uh, with Keir Starmer? I suppose we should, really. I mean, uh, because apart from the fact that he's been under much criticism, uh, quite rightly in my view, over this business of cronyism with Lord Wahid Ali's past, which we still haven't really heard the truth about. Um, not only that, but this weekend we find out that not only was he in receipt of gifts from Wahid Ali, but so was Mrs Starmer. Yes, so we already knew that Lord Wahid Ali had given £16,000 to Keir Starmer to pay for his wardrobe during the general election campaign, to more than £2,000 to pay for various uh, pairs of spectacles uh, for the Labour leader and now the Prime Minister. And Lord Wahid Ali, by the way, was given a AAA all-access pass to Downing Street with no defined uh, job, which mm. was extremely... Um, uh, uh, it's, not, it's out of the ordinary, to be honest with you, and, and not in line... Uh, with what usually happens um, and then now we learn that, that he also uh, gave um, dresses um, to uh, Lady Starmer um, so that uh, she could and these are the words of uh, David Lammy the Foreign Secretary when he was out on the news rounds yesterday um, saying that the couple so they could look their best for Britain and he also made the point David Lammy the Foreign Secretary um, that uh, in this country the Prime Minister and his wife uh, spouse never d does not have um, a, a personal budget to pay for clothes that is expected to come out of their own budgets. Uh, and because of that, it is therefore necessary to go to donors um, to pay for it. And he said he pointed to an example in the United States. Of course, he's just returned from there to try and negotiate unsuccessfully um, the use of uh, British storm shadow missiles in Russian territory. But actually, that's not quite correct. So do, it doesn't take long. Well, it's not so much it's, uh, not, quite co it's not quite correct, it's Theo. It's, it's actually Sorry, wrong. I'm, I'm, no, it's wrong. It's wrong. It is wrong. It is wrong. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just. Don't hold back. <laughs> no, I'm not holding back. It's wrong. Yeah. Okay. And the reason it's wrong is because whilst it is true uh, that the president gets a fifty thousand pound budget for expenses, actually the uh, first lady does not get. Uh, a, a budget for uh, their clothes. And Laura Bush, who is, of course, the uh, wife of George Bush, often complained that she was ha having to pay to fund her dresses to look, uh, you know, to pay for expensive designer dresses, and it needed to come out of her right. personal budget. So, no, it right. is not true. And but they're allowed, and, and I mean, I looked into this last night as well, as you would expect, and yesterday, and it, it's quite uh, quite permissible, in fact, for donors donors to, to lend dresses. So Michelle Obama yes. used to do this quite a lot. Uh, she would get a designer and give the designer a nice big sort of publicity um, hit because she'd wear a dress. Mm. But then the rule is that the dress has to be given away. So they get it yeah. to wear for one time only. They don't get to keep it and take it home at the end of the presidency. Do you know what I mean? So David Lammy, once yeah. again, getting the complete, getting completely the wrong, not only the wrong information, but the wrong sort of, you know, tone for the nation. Because people are saying, I mean, we just had a voice note from somebody saying, yeah, um, yeah, he does actually get an allowance for, uh, for, for clothing. It's called his salary. Like the rest of us, you know, if you're wearing a shirt right now, I presume you're not charging the taxpayer for it. You know, I'm wearing this uh, suit no, which no. I bought myself. <laughs> and quite funnily enough, if you try and claim clothing, uh, even as an independent contractor from the tax man, most of the time the tax man will say you can't have that done. You can't call it an expense. So it's good enough for the Prime Minister, not good enough for us. Yes, and this is, of course, at the same time, Mike, uh, as we're told that we're all going to have to tighten our belts ahead of the budget on October the 30th. Right. So pensioners... Uh, losing the winter fuel allowance. We're also looking now at uh, the removal of the single home discount, which is seen as a tax on widows because over, over more around half of those um, affected by the uh, single home discount who can benefit from it are uh, pensioners because they've lost their spouses. Right. So this is a time where the Prime Minister is able... Um, well, of course, you know, the good thing claim for his budget. The good thing about Keir Starmer is when he tightens his belt, you know it's a nice leather one bought for him by Lord Wahid Ali. Um, let's have a look at what Keir Starmer said before he was Prime Minister about donations to political leaders. The Prime Minister, the Prime Minister will be aware that he's required to declare any benefits that relate to his political activities, including loans or credit arrangements, within 28 days. 28 days, Prime Minister, yes. He will also know that any donation must be recorded in the register of ministers' interests and that under the law any donation of over £500 to a political party must be registered and declared. So the rules are very clear. The Electoral Commission now think that there are reasonable grounds to suspect that an offence or offences may have occurred. That's incredibly serious.
Yeah, it is incredibly serious. Um, the rules are very clear, apparently. So between then and now, somehow Keir Starmer forgot what the rules were, didn't declare his wife's donation, um, declared his own only after he was kind of pushed for it. Um, I'm still asking the question, what's the 20,000 accommodation allowance for? Because I don't understand why during election period you need 20,000 quid when you're running around doing campaign uh, work and you're going from presumably your own house to various other places. I don't know whether uh, he was getting special treatment wherever he went, whether he was staying in a hotel, I just don't know. But nobody's, I think I'm right in saying, told us what that £20,000 accommodation allowance paid for. No, we don't know. We don't know exactly what it's paid for. And we also don't know in the exact job of what Lord Wahid Ali was able to do mm. uh, when he went into Downing Street with that all-access pass. So the, all we know is that he was able to attend political meetings, but we don't know exactly his role in um, Downing Street. And it's important for transparency that uh, whilst we elect um, uh, politicians, we also know who's in yeah. the building advising them and what they you know what they offer that particular elected right. politician now if it's that they've paid for huge amounts of uh, clothing and accommodation expenses um then you would you would expect that that actually should be declared straight up so that we know who who yes. is providing the advice and what yeah. they've done and, and within and within 28 days please because apparently the rules are yes. very clear uh, and he's already but gone this over is there hypocrisy exactly it's right hypocrisy, and that's the problem Oh, so you're old enough to, to remember, Theo, as I do, the cash for access scandal that the Tories had. Mm -hmm. You know, this to me seems exactly right uh, and to fit into that particular description, cash for access, because you can imagine, because Lord Wahid Ali has also bankrolled a few other people, including Sue Gray's son, right? So this is a man who, whenever he rings anyone in Downing Street, I'm sure gets straight through, whether it's Angela Rayner who he's given money to, whether it's Rachel Reeves who he's given money to, whether it's the Prime Minister who he's given money to, whether it's Mrs Starmer. You know, the bottom line is this guy has paid money for access. So that's called cash yes. for access, as far as I'm concerned. Yes, and, 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 and the point that you... And you raised it when you played that excerpt out from Keir Starmer in the House of Commons, is that throughout the election campaign, until they really start... And we're talking until the final few weeks. But, you know, going back to the beginning of the year, when we all knew there was going to be a general election this year, Keir Starmer was very clear that one of the defining points between Labour and the Conservatives was that he was going to come in and clean up politics even admitted necessary when before they'd actually outlined their policies. There wasn't a huge amount between uh, Labour and the Tories, according to Keir Starmer. But the, re the reason he said that he should be elected as Prime Minister and Labour should become the party of government is because he said that they would clean it up. They'd get rid of the cronyism. Mm. They'd get rid of uh, uh, any allegations that we've seen against the Tories of corruption, whether it be VIP lanes for COVID or, or the like. And he would come in and he would clean up politics and it would be better as a result of having him in charge <laughs> and now of course don't make me laugh now, of course, <laughs> it's only monday morning isn't it I know. Um, but now uh, but now of course we see you know that actually that he hasn't played by the same rules that he said that others namely the Conservative needed to play by. No, this is very serious, as he would say. Now, let's talk a little bit about a couple of other things, because Sue Gray's name came up. Harry Cole has got a very interesting piece in his column this morning in The Sun. Um, Prime Minister's all-seeing aide Sue Gray has been handed a seat on the National Security Council, um, and its ad hoc nature has been moved to weekly as a meeting every cabinet, uh, every uh, after cabinet every Tuesday. Also, Pat McFadden gets a permanent seat on the powerful committee, which shows where the power lies in the administration. So Pat McFadden, he says, um, is Deputy Prime Minister in all but name. Mm. Angela Rayner sort of pushed to the background. Now, some people might not think this is important, but I think it's very significant yeah. that Sue Gray has kind of extended, if you like, um, her remit. Um, and yeah. as Harry points yeah. out, when Dominic Cummings apparently went to a COVID meeting, there was a meltdown uh, on the Labour side. But of course, you know, once again, now that they're running the show, they do what they like. Yes, the National Security Council is a very, very senior... Uh, executive committee within government that includes all of the security chiefs, military chiefs, mm. and the national security advisor. When Keir Starmer gets around to appointing uh, that national security advisor, it's, it's said to be somebody that only Sue Gray uh, will approve of. And if you think back to how it, it's quite a secretive committee, and it's not expected that there are ever any leaks from um, that committee, and, and that's for good reason, because of course it's dealing with national security issues. Um, you'll remember that Gavin Williamson had to resign. Mm. Sir Gavin Williamson had to uh, resign uh, as Defence Secretary after he leaked details or was accused of leaking details um, of, from that committee by yeah. uh, Mark Sedwell. 
um, and there was an investigation. He was asked to hand over his vote. He denied the allegation. But it is a very senior committee, and it is where, in terms of security, where the power uh, resides. And, you're, and Harry's, of course, uh, completely on the money that Pat McFadden gets a seat on this um, committee. He's a, he's a cabinet, senior cabinet office minister, national campaign coordinator. But you would expect that, actually, if you're talking about the most senior politicians within the Labour Party, Angela Rayner has the actual title of being uh, deputy prime minister yeah. but uh, of course there have been accusations that she's been pushed to one side she's had her remit stripped um in the department for uh housing um uh, you know various parts of uh, the negotiations when it comes to workers rights have been uh, t- t- taken off her and given to john jonathan reynolds over in business you know th- th- there is a there is a a feeling that Angela Rayner, and actually I have some sympathy for Angela Rayner with this. I'm not somebody who sit, that sits there and says, it's, um, you know, th- this is necessary. This, you know, it, it, I think she feel she could rightly feel actually that she's had her she's had her department, her title, her role as the deputy prime minister, in effect carved up yeah. by various other senior ministers within the government. In this case, it's given to Pat McFadden when it comes to national yeah. security. No question. I mean, she's definitely been sort of placed in the in the sort of naughty corner and she was wheeled out, wasn't she, um, the other day, only to be sort of ridiculed by Lee Anderson when she was forced to give him a ludicrous new definition of Islamophobia, which she couldn't really mm. which she couldn't really do. Let's just finish up with one final thing. A couple of things that happened over the weekend, in addition to Keir Starmer presumably getting a free uh, football ticket to go and watch Arsenal beating Tottenham with David Lammy. Uh, he also went to the St Ledger race course in Doncaster where he got booed uh, and heckled quite significantly. I think that's going to happen to him everywhere he now goes. Also, MP Alex Barker uh, also um, got heckled in a pub. Um, initially, it was thought that she was chased out of the pub, but supposedly she didn't get chased out. Uh, she's claiming that the people who were giving her a hard time uh, were sort of local activists. But let's have a look at this. Now, it's pretty unpleasant, that, for her, um, but unfortunately, I'm afraid, for Labour MPs who are making decisions which are upsetting an awful lot of working-class people, that's in Aldershot, by the way, uh, people who are upset about the housing of migrants in hotels, people who are upset about the pension allowance being taken away, you know, I mean, this is what's going to happen. It, it, it's, not, it's not good that any MP should be um, chased out of a, a pub or feel unsafe in their, in their constituencies, uh, Mike, um, but, but this is... Um, you know, and, and, and it's difficult to tell exactly what's being shouted. I think it was something enough is enough was being shouted yeah. um, in that in that clip because I think they're uh, particularly unhappy in order shot. I would assume it's and, and this is an assumption. It's about um, my migration. That's part of it, yeah. Hotels. Yeah, from what from what you can hear there, this, this is you know this is going to become and and it's it's, it's not pleasant and, and it's not something I would ever condone. But it's going to be something that's it's going to become a, a, you know we're going to see more of it. I would guess. Um, and of course, you know, Keir Starmer is in, you know, the migration crisis is a really serious one. And he's in uh, Italy uh, talking to Giorgio Maloney, uh, the Prime Minister of Italy today, to try and solve it. Mm. Interestingly, he's going back to. Um, he's going back to, um, <clears throat> uh, you, you know, an idea of uh, trying to create offshoring uh, asylum centres. And, uh, you know, there's been a reduction, 60% reduction, Italy's seen in terms of uh, the number of migrants crossing the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea since they signed an agreement with uh, Albania. Yeah. I, I think that actually Keir Starmer having, um, you know, decided not to press ahead with Rwanda, deciding very early, a decision that he was criticised for, is now starting to open the door to offshore processing. Uh, when he was asked about it, he said, let's see. Right. Um, so I think there's a recognition that actually that some sort of deterrent or some sort of offshore processing is going to be needed. But I think the difference that is the case with the what Italy is doing uh, with Albania compared to what we were doing with Rwanda was that when Boris Johnson and Priti Patel came up with the Rwanda scheme, it was a one-way ticket. So if you went to Rwanda, 
you weren't coming back to um, Britain in any legal form because they, you, they, even if you won your asylum case, you would still be in Rwanda. This country viewed Rwanda to be a this country UK viewed Rwanda to be a safe country. But I think it's going to be very interesting now to see how whether actually Keir Starmer in effect does a reverse ferret mm. and goes back on that Rwanda decision and actually comes up with something to try and reduce the migration numbers. I mean, he's finally appointed a commander in Martin Hewitt from the National Police yeah. Chiefs um, Council, but one appointment is not going to stop these crossings. And of course, we saw another no, eight course. people tragically lose their lives at the weekend. Mm, absolutely right. Theo, good to talk to you. We've got to run. Thank you very much indeed. Theo Usher with their political commentator.